Purchasing a used sailboat for the first time can be a daunting task, especially if you're purchasing your boat in a foreign country on the other side of the world. You don't know anyone, you cannot speak the language, you don't know the law. And here you are handing your hard-earned cash to someone and you don't know and hope all goes well. It may seem overwhelming, nerve-wracking, it is stressful, but there are a number of us who has done it and done it with success. In this video, I'm going to share our end-to-end -end boat purchasing process in the Med. From prep work to offer, from negotiation to registering your boat under your name. First of all, I want to state that I am not a yacht broker or a surveyor or any type of marine professional. I am a first time sailboat owner who just went through the process of purchasing a used sailboat in the Mediterranean. And this is not an instructional video, but an informative one. In this episode, I will be covering the steps we followed to find and purchase our dream boat. It worked for us and hopefully some parts or all of it will help you with your choices in your journey to your dream boat. The work we did in preparation, things we learned, mistakes we made along the way, mistakes you don't have to go through and hopefully come and join us in the mid as soon as possible. Well, let's dive right into it. Welcome back to episode number two of CB Sailing. In our first video, we covered our boat shopping experience in Croatia, where we showcased seven, seven used sailboats until we find our dream boat. We received a lot of feedback from viewers, and inquiries were mostly relative to buying process. We were hoping our second video will take place in Croatia while we are on CB and doing some actual sailing, but our departure date from America has been pushed out a few weeks to accommodate COVID vaccinations that we just got approval for. So uh, while we have this extra time, we have decided to create a second video to address some of the questions and requests we received from our first video. Uh, questions relative to our choice of boat, uh, pricing, uh, surveying, uh, flagging, deflagging, VAT complications, registration, etc. I am going to break down the end-to-end -end, end -end process into segments to help simplify the process. A process otherwise may look little intimidating. Uh, the main areas that I'm going to cover in this video are um, research and prep work, logistics and timing, and the purchase process itself. Starting with research and prep work. Um, start with determining your sail plan and living arrangements. A lot of us gets really excited to dive into the most exciting part, which is the sailboat itself. The image of the sailboat is the driving force of all our dreams, and we have an idea of what type of boat we want and what type of boat we want to sail. However, Starting with the new sailboat may not be the right approach as your long-term sail plans and your living arrangements should define the boat you need, not the other way around. Um, are you planning on living on board? Are you planning on sailing high latitudes? Are you planning on crossing in oceans or are you want to do more like weekend sailing in a lake or uh, on a protected bay? You want to do some island hopping in the Caribbean? or you want to do some Mediterranean sailing in the summer only. During our six years of dreaming, saving, and planning, our sales plan changed three times. For us, understanding our sail plan and living arrangements was the important step to determine the type of sailboat we needed for our situation. Like other aspects in life, when it comes to sailing, we are not all the same. 
and each one of us different needs, priorities, and ambitions. Most sellers I have met are opinionated people, but thankfully there is a right boat for each one of us. We find the one that works for us. You need to find yours. Remember, the boat is a vehicle to take you to your destination. It is not the destination. Although it is important, do not caught up with the vehicle, but rather, rather focus on the end goal. Once you determine your sale plan and living arrangements, next step is identifying the type of boat that complements your choices of sailing and lifestyle. In this stage, I would recommend try to be as broad as you can and have as many options you feel comfortable with. Most modern production boats share similar build and design characteristics. I cannot tell you what make and model is better than the other, but what I can tell you is the boat is important, but really it is secondary. The other recommendation I have at this stage is try to get on as many sailboats as you can. If you have the ability to charter different type of boats, do so to get a feeling of each one of them and see which one you like better. Sailing clubs are a great resource to get a feel of different type of sailboats. Our sailing club in San Francisco Bay had a charter fleet of boats ranging from 1980s full keel heavy displacements Hans Christians in color to brand new Janelle sloops. From performance oriented J105s to well respected cruisers such as Tartans, Sabres and Calibers and almost anything and everything in between. We, did, uh, we also did a number of destination charters in Caribbean and uh, Mediterranean on newer modern production boats. Having access to a wide variety of boats, whether it's through a club or um, a destination charter, really gives you a, a gauge of what kind of boat you feel most comfortable with and what kind of boat suits your needs the best. Once you determine the type of sailboat you need for your needs, um, start building a database. There are a number of websites you can research for availability, options, and pricing. This step becomes instrumental later in the process, helping you quickly gauge whether or not um, asking price of a, a specific sailboat is within range relative to the comparables. In my database, I have captured data points such as when did the, ves uh, the vessel first become available, uh, what was the initial asking price? Uh, how long has it been in the market? What is the current asking price? Uh, what's the location and the options? I suggest you start building your database as soon as possible. More data you capture, better informed you are. Mine went back almost two years, but some of the boats were long gone by the time we pulled the trigger. But that is okay as the intention here is not to go after every boat, but gather real market data and make educated decisions. You are going to start noticing trends such as high priced boat owners finally coming to reality and lowering their prices in time. And um, some popular models uh, uh, at reasonable prices being sold right away. One of the downsides with our approach was we were focused on only one make and model, which limited our options greatly. Uh, not necessarily a bad thing, but uh, the broader you are, more options you're going to have. Um, the next thing is that don't, don't be shy about um, contacting the brother, uh, brokers. Uh, start contacting them early, uh, even if you're not in the position to pull trigger. Just to understand the availability, uh, this step becomes extremely important if you're considering next charter boats. Depending on uh, the part of the year you're planning on traveling to Europe and your desired set sail day, the availability of the boats can vary greatly. The next step is narrow down your database into a short list to the top contenders. Uh, once you feel your time is getting close, uh, start reducing your database into a short list of finalists. The ones that stand out the most for your needs. Uh, being broad really helps here. 
uh, I will recommend having 15 to 20 bullets in that short list. Uh, we will cover the reasons why you should have that many in your short list in detail in a few minutes. There's also a couple of areas that I wanted to cover. Uh, one, of, one of them being the owner's version of production boats are um, kind of rare in European market. Even with privately owned boats, most European fa uh, families, they prefer extra cabins to accommodate extended family where in US, you usually see folks prefer more open floor plans with less cabins. Another um, information here is like the, the, the charter versus privately owned. Uh, for most folks, this is a fork in the road and you either go one way or the other. Although we started our, our search with only considering privately owned, later on we decided to have an open mind to ex-charter as well. Uh, this opens up inventory greatly. This is an ongoing debate and I'm not going to tell you which one is better because it is not one size fits all. The pros and cons for both are there. It is your call. You need to decide which suits the best, your needs and your budget. What I can tell you though, if you are considering ex charter boats, this is where fundamental differences in purchase process takes place. With ex charter boats, timing of your purchase becomes extremely important. And that is one of the mistakes we went through. The other important factor about charter boats is availability. These boats may be for sale, but they are not always available for immediate delivery. We will cover this in logistics section in detail. The next section I want to cover is um, price and information gathering. Make sure you get in touch with sellers and brokers as, you, as you're putting your short list together to avoid any last minute surprises. Are the vessels still available? Are the, the engine hours current? Pricing up to date? Start reaching out to brokers and sellers at least a month in advance. You will be surprised to find out some of the boats are long gone but the listing is still up uh, or in case of charter boats uh, boats have having charter obligations and not available for delivery until the end of sailing season next item in the list is is the checklist i recommend that you create a comprehensive checklist that applies to all boats i am not a marine surveyor and i'm assuming most of you aren't either. The checklist helps you to be disciplined about what to look for in any given vessel. Remember, you are going to have limited time and it is likely that you have only a matter of hours with these yachts, so checklists will make sure you don't miss anything important. I have created one for my trip and provided a link to my checklist below. Feel free to modify for your needs. The next item in the list is brokers. Depending on what country you're flying into, review and research the brokers that offer uh, the yachts in your short list. Uh, use reputable, uh, well-recommended brokers. The person you're going to be dealing with is as important as the boat. Um, start engaging with the brokers early, not only to gain insight to the boat, but have a feeling uh, of the broker as well. Uh, they are, uh, are they responsive? They're, are they attentive? Are they knowledgeable of the yachts? Um, expect the brokers not having answers to your questions right away. Uh, in some instances, the brokers may have never seen the vessel and don't know more than you do. It may sound a little odd, but that is acceptable. They usually go back to the owner with your questions and circle back to you with answers. Um, I have worked with three different brokers in Croatia and was really impressed with one of them, uh, even though I didn't buy from them. Gather as much information as possible before you make your trip. Um, another important tip is to ask for a copy of their 
generic purchase agreement. Um, and do that ahead of time. Even if you end up not buying from them, uh, this will give you a perspective of terms and conditions uh, covered in these agreements. Um, all brokers I have worked with had English versions of their generic sales agreement. Next item in the agenda is logistics and timing. First of all, I strongly recommend that you don't buy a used sailboat site unseen. Um, if you do not want to travel to the boat, a common approach is to hire a marine surveyor at this stage and have him or her inspect the boat for you and provide you a report. I believe in a professional marine survey uh, and you should absolutely do it. But at this stage, in my opinion, it is premature. I feel like you have to see, smell, hear and feel the boat and make up your mind before you invest in hiring the surveyor. Therefore, I am afraid, I have to say, you have to travel there. Well, you travel there, what's the best time to go there? Best time to go there is right after sailing season for two reasons. Reason number one, um, and, then, and then right after sailing season, meaning that is in the med beginning of October. Um, so the reason number one is you have the most leverage in your negotiations, especially for boats that are active in charter fleets. And also for privately boats that are wrapping up their sailing season. A second reason is the cost of travel and accommodations are inexpensive because it is being off season. So the charter season for ex-charter boats, this is very extremely important and massively overlooked area, especially if you are uh, open to ex-charter boats and one of the biggest learnings from our experience. Um, if you're in the market for an ex-charter boat, I suggest you start your, um, your search at least a year in advance. So by the end of the sailing season, prior year, you are ready to pull the trigger. For a boat that is active in charter fleet, as far as negotiations concerned, you have the most leverage at the end of the sailing season. In Croatia, again, that is uh, beginning of October. The next thing in the logistics section is, is um, organize your shortlist into like geographical zones and determine a home base for you. To make the most of your, um, of your visit, you need to be very strategic about your logistics. Once you have your, um, your shortlist, group them into geographic locations and determine a home base. From there, uh, do daily drives, to review them in batches. Uh, I recommend no more than three or four boats a day. Remember the checklist that we mentioned earlier? This is where it comes handy. Be disciplined about your check checklist and keep good notes when you visit the boats. As it gets challenging to remember details about each boat when you are looking at several each day. Everything starts to blur after a few days, especially if you're looking at sim similar make and models. In my case, I remembered a fridge or a navigation instrument clearly, but without the checklist, I couldn't call which boat it was on. Um, all the details start blur by day three. Um, another tip I have is carry your passport with you at all times. Compared to America, Europe is a small continent where you may find yourself at a border crossing. For example, on my drive to Split, on my dr drive from Split, Croatia, to Slano, Croatia, yes, they're both Croatia, I had to cross the Bosnian border twice each way. Thankfully, I had my passport with me, otherwise I could never made it to Solana on my last day and find CB. So what does the cost of stay and car rental look like in off-season? Um, 
Although Croatia is not known as an inexpensive destination, however, during off-season, car rentals and um, housing accommodations are very reasonable. You can find a decent, um, clean place to stay in the heart of Split Old Town for only 12 to 15 euros. And um, a car rental will cost you somewhere between 80 to 100 euros for the week. Okay, you find the right boat for your needs and now ready to pull the trigger. What comes next? The purchase process. The purchase agreement and what to look for. If you are dealing with a broker, obtain a generic copy of the purchase agreement ahead of time. Um, generally in Croatia and Turkey, from my experience, what is expected from you is about 10% down payment to show that you are actually a serious buyer. Before you hand over the money though, uh, there are a few things uh, you should consider. First of all, once again, make sure you're working with a reputable broker. Second, ensure that you are depositing the money into an escrow account. If you're working with a reputable broker, that probably will be the case. Um, working with multiple brokers, each broker has their own purchase agreement template with their set of terms and conditions. It is beneficial to see the similarities and differences between the agreements. If there are certain terms in one agreement, presumably that the ones that are protecting the buyer, but not on the other, you can always ask that clause to be added to the other agreement. At this point, you do know that it's reasonable to ask because it was captured in the other and, the, and your broker should work with you getting that clause or any other clause you deem appropriate in the agreement. Make sure your offer is contingent upon sea trial and marine survey. I cannot emphasize enough the importance of hiring a professional surveyor as part of the purchase process. They are not cheap, but well worth it. In our case in Croatia, I have contacted four surveyors and prices range from 600 euros to 800 euros. So next item in the list is offer and negotiation. Once you feel comfortable with the sales agreement, next step is the offer. A lot of people have a lot of opinion around what is acceptable. Uh, my experience tell me there is no one size fits all. I hear people say offer 20% less of what asking price and then if they don't take it, walk away. It may apply in some situations, but I can tell you, it won't apply all. Here is my experience. What I recommend and what you should expect. First of all, there's quite a bit of a difference on what to expect from this um, privately owned yachts and, and charter yachts. If you're dealing with an owner whose boat is in active charter fleet, Timing becomes extremely important, and here's why. Charter boats are privately owned, not by the charter company. These boats are business assets, meaning the very existence of these vessels is to make money. They only make money half of the year. The other half of the year, they cost money to the owner. Best time to pull trigger on these yachts is right after the charter season. Most of the, the met that is uh, beginning of October. Um, that is when you have the most leverage because the boats are entering to a phase that is going to cost money to the owner. However, starting holiday season, mid to late December, the boat starts being booked for the upcoming sailing season. At this point, there are two important things working against you. One, 
inventory reduces dramatically due to the spots having charter obligations. This is extremely important. The boat can still be advertised for sale, but will not be available until end of charter season. Call the broker to make sure the vessel is available for immediate delivery if you are planning to set sail soon. Number two, closer you get to the sailing season, more charters are booked and more you lose your negotiation power. In our case, I flew to Croatia mid-January late for shopping, hoping we can close the deal and start sailing by May. Of the 20 or so boats in our shortlist, only less than half were actually available for immediate delivery. Rest of the boats did not want to even talk to us unless we were willing to wait until October for the boats to um, fulfill their charter obligations. I did extend an offer on an ex charter boat approximately 15% under the asking price. To that offer, the owner came back with two options. He said, either pay my full asking price now and take the boat, or B, I accept your offer, but the, the boat will not be available after the charter season. I was upset, but I couldn't argue with this explanation, which was strictly business. He said, if I sell you my boat now for the full asking price, I'll get my full asking price. If I charter my boat for another season and take your offer after the charter season, I get my full asking price. I turned around, I walked away, and I'm telling you now, no one came running after me. Okay, so you're not interested in chartered boats, but wondering what the experience is like for private boats. In that case, timing becomes less important um, other than closer you get to the sailing season, more the owner wants to enjoy his or her boat for another year. Um, the primary challenge I have experienced with privately owned boats is Oftentimes, the, the owners develop an emotional connection and attachment with the boat. Um, do not discount the fact that this person you're dealing with, in my experience, older males, is not quite ready to depart with their uh, pride and joy, but often pressured by their loved ones or family to sell it. Um, in these instances, calling out major defects is appropriate, but honing in small flaws in hope for negotiation leverage brings great offense to the owner, and it is off-putting. Uh, most owners who take pride in their boats would like to see their legacy continue in the care of someone who is going to take care of the boat the way they did. And next item in the list is marine survey and sea trial. Make sure your offer is contingent upon marine survey and sea trial. Also make sure the sea trial and the marine survey is captured in the sales agreement. The usual for, um, for this clause uh, goes like this. Um, if the cost of repairs fund by the professional uh, surveyor exceeds 10% or more of the actual purchase price, buyer has the option to get out um, the entire contract and collect the deposit, which is conveniently set at 10%. Meaning, um, if the agreed purchase price of the boat is $100,000, then the threshold is 10% of the $100,000, which is $10,000. If the surveyor report comes back, uh, with repairs, let's say for $12,000. Then as the buyer, you have the option to get out of the contract and collect your deposit, which should sit in escrow account versus someone's private account. At this point, 
you will be out for your travel expenses, but you will recover your deposit. I wanted to emphasize that the buyer has the option. You may choose to continue with the deal using the findings as a leverage for second round of negotiation. In the same example, if the cost of repairs is less than $10,000, unless otherwise stated in the contract, you are obligated to move forward with the purchase. In other words, if you pull out at this point, you will lose your deposit. Make sure your contract states that the cost of repairs are seller's responsibility. The seller has the option to complete the repairs on his or her expense or reduce the price um, accordingly or combination of the both. Um, Make sure, another thing is to make sure that the, the, the sales contract um, states a deadline uh, for the seller to exercise his obligations. You do not want to wait for months for repairs to take place and miss a week or months of the sailing season. The next item we have in the list is closing, registration, flagging, and VAT. Uh, this item can have its own episode. I can only speak from my experience, a US citizen buying a US flag boat in foreign land. In our case, we bought a US flag boat registered by US Coast Guard. The process couldn't be smoother. Not much different than buying a used car. The seller signs off the boat just like a pink slip on a used car with new owner's information, you pay the registration fees. I believe it was about $60 per year with US Coast Guard. Uh, wait for a month, two, I don't know, or um, and then US Coast Guard sends you a new registration. You are now a boat owner. At this point, you are not subject to VAT because your boat is in a temporary importation status in EU waters. Uh, you're not uh, subject to U.S. taxes because you are not sailing in U.S. waters. However, EU gives you maximum of 18 months to stay in TI status. Once the time is up, you need to leave EU waters and return back to EU to restart the clock. One important th thing that we learned along the way is the TI status is connected to the boat, not the owner. For example, by the time of the purchase, if the boat is in TI status and has been in EU waters for 16 months, your clock does not reset because of the ownership, change of ownership. You have only two months left before you reach the 18 month threshold to re-import your vessel back to you, EU. We did not know that. And by the time our marina alerted us, for the fact that the time is coming up, we were back in US, far away from CB. Luckily, we made some friends. We were in Croatia and they led us to a professional skipper who successfully re-imported CB and reset the clock on our behalf. One interesting side note um, is the skipper who re-imports the vessel to EU, whether it's you or a hired skipper uh, must be a non-EU citizen. Another important point is, uh, to, in order to re-import your vessel back to EU, you do not need to check in into another non-EU country. All that is needed is to leave EU waters and turn back to where you left off. If you find yourself buying a boat under similar circumstances where um, make a note of the TI status and the deadline for re-importing your vessel. If you miss the deadline and your vessel stays in EU others for more than 18 months, um, its status changes and it becomes subject to VAT, which can be as much as 20% or more uh, of the value of the vessel. If the vessel is foreign flagged, 
and you want to deflag and reflag with American or Canadian, this is where a reputable broker becomes really handy. If you're dealing direct with an owner, I recommend you hire an agency to take on this task. The bureaucracy in most European countries is complex, confusing, and uh, frustrating, especially for a person who doesn't speak the language. In Croatia, trying to take this on your own may cost you a lot of money and time so that you can miss a sailing season. Remember, once you deflag your vessel, the vessel cannot move anywhere, but has to stay in the marina until she is being reflagged. If you are into saving pennies, look elsewhere and have a professional handle this piece for you. You may likely to spend tenfold in marina fees for a boat you cannot sail. Well, we hope this answers some of the questions we received along the way, and I really hope this helps some of you with your buying process. Uh, we will be departing shortly to start our long-awaited adventure, and we can't wait for you to come over and join us in the match.